And so anti-Semitism is a kind of, the one way to think about it is that it's a thought virus. There is no permission from the Torah to have any mercy during war. Not on children, not on women, not on anybody. Now, if you know it, there's a terrorist in a building, and this terrorist will kill many Jews. It's just a matter of time, because that's what he does all his life. And there's an opportunity to throw a bomb on his head. But maybe a few Arab kids will get hurt. And they say, well, the kids are innocent. How are you going to kill two, three, eight kids that are there in the building? They're going to get killed. So the answer is, if you don't kill those supposedly innocent kids, what would happen later? This one will kill 50 Jews. They will become terrorists one way or the other. So that's what the Torah say. But the point is right here that Hashem say, do not have mercy on the children. Kill all their children also. Why? There's no difference between them and their children. In 10 years from now, these children will attack you on the way. Hashem knows. God knows. Whatever you're going to have, the Jews will always control you. Like, like a character. Everywhere you go in the world. Like a Who character. Who's running all the financial? Always the Jews. The Jews are in charge of the world. Science, financial, politics, behind the presidents. Even now, everybody knows that all the campaign of Donald Trump is, in son, is his son-in-law, the Jew, Kash Kushner. That's how Hashem made the world. Everywhere, the Jews always run the financial. Here in America, the Jews run the show. Everywhere. What we in America call terrorists are really groups of people that reject the international system. We have heard that a half a million children have died. I mean, that's more children than died when, when, in, in Hiroshima. And, and, you know, is the price worth it? I think this is a very hard choice, but the price, we think the price is worth it. Um, and a vision and a covenant between the pieces of sacrificed animals, and in this vision he was promised all the land of Canaan. Genesis 15 says, to your descendants I will given this land from the rivers of Egypt to the great river, the river Euphrates. The Canaanites, the Canaanites, the Cadmonites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Ephraim, the Mamorites, the Canaanites, the Gergesites, and the Jebusites. So here we have, we have ten nations, ten nations of Canaan. Actually Canaan, in the Bible in Genesis 10, has twelve sons. Ham had a son named Canaan. Canaan had twelve sons. Ten of these sons received temporarily, as if to say, the land of Canaan that would eventually be given to Israel. In the time of Abraham, the time of Abraham was promised the lands of ten of those Canaanite nations. Later, when the Israelites came out of Egypt and the conquered the land, there were only seven, seven Canaanite nations that had to be conquered. The others had been occupied by Moab and Ammon, the children of Lot, and by the Edomites. But in the future, these three nations would also have lands that Israelites would possess. And these nations, they moved. As the same way as the ten tribes moved, so too they moved. And eventually they went to Europe and occupied areas of Europe and occupied areas that these ten tribes later also occupy. And we have in these areas, according to different sources, especially that of Hatem Sofa, that Hatem Sofa lived in the 1800s. He was a very great rabbi. He was inspired in some ways. And he said that these areas were the areas of Western Europe, including the British Isles. And in the end times, they would belong to Israel. And so, in effect, that is what will happen, because the Israelites from the ten tribes did go to those areas, did settle in them, did become a great nation through owning those, nation, those uh, areas. In the future, a portion of the ten tribes will return to the land of Israel and occupy the area of greater Israel from the Nile to the Euphrates together with Judah. The land will be divided up amongst the twelve tribes, but they will also keep the lands that they will come to, the lands that they will have come to the, the, in the West, including the America and so on, will still belong to them. They will receive the Kedusha, the sanctity of the land of Israel, which will be, which will be as if they are one country. 
And even now, people are feeling this. Benjamin Netanyahu, the Prime Minister of Israel, he recently spoke to America and to the West saying, I, we are you, and you are us. In other words, there's a certain basic element, a commonality, a, a common denominator between us, which may, which may reflect a mutual ancestry way, way back in the past of basically all of us being descended from the eight tribes of Israel. And by becoming aware that you're descended from the tribe of Israel through the lost end tribes, that you are Israelites, you are fulfilling a sacred task. You are doing a good deed. You are doing what the Almighty wants in our time. And you will be rewarded for this. Learning about the lost end tribes, being conscious of it. That is what God wants to do according to the Bible, according to our understanding of the Bible. This scenario is borne out by none other than Prime Minister David Ben-Gurion, one of the great founders of Israel. Recorded in an astonishing article in Look magazine, Ben-Gurion predicted that a one-world system presided over by Jerusalem will be set up in the near future. All continents will become united in a world alliance, at whose disposal will be an international police force. All armies will be abolished, and there will be no more war. In Jerusalem, the United Nations, a truly united nations, will build a shrine of the prophets to serve the federated union of all continents. This will be the seat of the Supreme Court of Mankind to settle all controversies among the federated continents as prophesied by Isaiah. This rabbi, he told Netanyahu that Netanyahu will be leading Israel when the Mashiach arrives. Right? Wow. Um, so, that's the other thing is that most Jews believe that the coming of the Messiah must take place before the year 6000 after creation. He has to come and accomplish everything before the year 6000. The year now, by the way, is 5784 after creation. The final hours of the sixth day, that's how the rabbis put it. <laughs> Often when there is dissent expressed in the United States against policies of the Israeli government, um, uh, people here are called anti-Semitic. Uh, what is your response to that as an Israeli Jew? Well, it's a trick. We always use it. When from Europe somebody is criticizing Israel, then we bring up the Holocaust. When in this country people are criticizing Israel, then they are anti-Semitic. And the organization is strong and has a lot of money. And the, the ties between uh, Israel and the American esta Jewish establishment are very strong. And they are strong in this country. As you know, uh, they have power, which it's okay, they are talented people and they have power, money and uh, media and other things. And their attitude is Israel, my country, right or wrong, the identification. And they are not ready to hear criticism. And it's very easy to blame people who criticize certain acts of the Israeli government as anti-Semitics and to bring up the Holocaust and the suffering of the Jewish people and that's, that justify everything we do to the Palestinians. I, on the other hand, served in the Israeli army, an army of occupation, an army of oppression, an army whose sole purpose is to make sure that he does not have a state, he does not have rights, and he dare not resist. So yes, my army has uniforms and commanders and generals, but which one of us is really the terrorist? You suddenly learn that everything you know is not true. The reality is that Israel had created a one state. The borders in terms of what, from Israeli perspective, are very clear. The borders of the state of Israel are the Jordan River on the east and the Mediterranean on the west. That's it. 
If you look at Israeli school books, if you look at the weather maps, if you look at any official maps of the state of Israel, it is absolutely clear. There is no question in anybody's mind what the borders of the state of Israel are. That's it. So the notion that there could be as an Israeli government that would give up some of that is absolutely absurd. And Israel governs this one state very skillfully with three different sets of laws. You have the laws that govern people like myself, Israeli Jews, who can come and go and say what they please. Pretty much a democratic state for all, for, for all purposes. You've got the laws that govern the Palestinians who are citizens of Israel, and there are over 30 laws in the law books that discriminate them, against them specifically, and you've got an entire culture of discrimination against them that is deep-seated and deep-rooted in Israeli society. And then you've got the laws that govern the Palestinians in the West Bank and Gaza, and this is really at the pleasure of the Israeli army. If they want to destroy, they destroy. If they want to arrest and beat, they arrest and beat. If they want to torture, they torture. If they want to kill, they kill. And Palestinians have no recourse. This is the reality. And with time, I began to realize this sign has nothing to do with security. The wall has nothing to do with security. The massive armed Israeli forces along the road have nothing to do with security. The terrorizing and harassment that Palestinian Israelis go through when they go through Tel Aviv airport, the humiliating process that they have to go through, they have to endure every time they decide to leave and go overseas, has nothing to do with security. It has everything to do with racism, with hatred, and with a deep desire to keep us apart, to keep me privileged and them with no rights. That's the name of the game. That's what it's all about. This is what they did. Palestine was erased completely from the map, and Israel was in completely over the entire map. This was the objective. This was the name of the game. Erasing Palestine, getting rid of the people, and de-Arabizing the country. De-Arabizing the country is what was left to do. That's why when people talk about the possibility of Israel somehow giving up the West Bank for a Palestinian state, if it wasn't so sad, it would be funny. It shows a complete misunderstanding of the objective of Zionism and the Jewish state, and the Zionist state. Because conquering the land was the first objective. Getting rid of the people and then de-Arabizing. And when I say de-Arabizing the country, this country has a 1,500-year-old history of Arab and Muslim rule. It was an Arab and a Muslim country more than it was anything else in history. So that has to be destroyed. Monuments have to be destroyed. Names have to be changed. The history has to be rewritten to connect once again King David to today's Israel and completely disregard the fact that this is in fact an Arab country. There's an education system, the Zionist education system, like Judith alluded, my sister just wrote a book about it, she's an educator, that teaches racism in a very subtle way. There's a bureaucracy, an entire bureaucracy, that is dedicated to making life impossible for Palestinians through all kinds of restrictions and permits and, uh, and requirements that are absolutely uncalled for and unnecessary, but are all given and provided under the guise of security. And then you've got the Israeli army, which I like to refer to as one of the most, one of the best trained, best equipped, best fed, terrorist organizations in the world. And yes, they have generals and they have nice uniforms, but their entire, their entire uh, purpose is terrorism. And just as one example, I'll give you one example, almost exactly four years ago, as Israel began its attack on Gaza, September the 27th, 2008, at 11.25 in the morning, what I refer to as the most shameful day in the Jewish history. The most shameful day in the history of the Jewish people. Israel began carpet bombing Gaza, and on the first day of a, what was to be a 21-day attack, they dropped 100 tons of bombs. 
Okay, a one-ton bomb will decimate an entire city block. Gaza is one of the most densely populated places in the world. 800,000 children live in Gaza. 11.25 is exactly the time when the morning school shift and the afternoon school shift change. So all the kids are in the streets. All the children are on the streets. That was the moment decided by the decision makers in Israel to begin the attack. This was the first day of a 21-day slaughter that had absolutely no justification. If that's not terrorism, I don't know what is. And this is how the state of Israel manages to control the different populations and somehow still keep up this very sweet liberal kind of face to everything. The, the brutal oppression under which the Palestinians have to live because of us is the cause of this. That is why this is happening. If we want this to happen, we have to lift the oppression. As long as Palestinians are denied hope and denied freedom and denied water and denied their land and their homes, this will continue to happen. I point a finger at my own government. Yes, we are racist. We believe in racism. There are races in the world and people have genetic traits. And that requires us to try and help them. The Jews are a more successful race. Outrage in Israel after recordings of instructors at a West Bank settlement pre-military academy surfaced, revealing them openly promoting Jewish supremacy. Other recorded comments advocated enslaving non-Jews for their genetic inferiority and even positive comments about Hitler. Let's just start with whether Hitler was right or not. He was the most correct person there ever was and was correct in every word he said. He was just on the wrong side. One poll found that two-thirds of Israeli teens believe Arabs to be less intelligent, uncultured, and violent. It also found that 50% of Israelis wouldn't live in the same building as Arabs, wouldn't befriend Arabs, wouldn't let their children befriend Arabs, and wouldn't let Arabs into their homes. Another poll found that 60% of Israeli Jews want segregation from Arabs. Another poll found that half of Israeli Jews agree with the statement, most Jews are better than most non-Jews because they were born Jews. The poll also found that 88% of Israeli Jews would be disturbed if their son befriended an Arab girl, and 90% would be disturbed if their daughter befriended an Arab boy. This poll found that about half of Israeli high schoolers don't think Arabs should have the right to vote. Another poll showed that almost half of Israeli Jews don't want Arabs teaching their kids. Not only are these views widely held in Israeli society, they're also represented in government, which codifies these sentiments into law. For example, Israel has is a law that says if an Israeli marries a Palestinian or someone from several other regional Arab states, that person isn't allowed to move in with said Israeli. This law was passed in 2003, but it's been renewed every single year since. Israel also doesn't allow interreligious marriage to be performed in the country, which is meant to deter Jews from marrying non-Jews. In 2018, Israel passed the nation-state law, a law which has constitutional status, which says the right to exercise national self-determination, i.e. have rights, is the exclusive right of Jews no one else. There's also the Nakba law, which makes it illegal to acknowledge the Nakba, the expulsions of Palestinians that were needed to found Israel. This would be like passing a law to make it illegal to talk about indigenous genocide or slavery in America. 
There's also the admissions committee law, which basically allows towns to operate panels that deny applications for entry based on socio-cultural compatibility, which essentially just legalizes racist housing discrimination. In Israel, advocating genocide of Palestinians doesn't hurt your chances of holding a high position in government. And in fact, in many cases, it helps. In 2014, Israeli lawmaker Ayelet Shaked wrote an unhinged rant on Facebook, calling all Palestinians enemy combatants and saying their mothers should be killed for giving birth to, quote, little snakes. The next year, she was appointed a Minister of Justice by Benjamin Netanyahu. Itamar Ben-Gavir, a lifelong admirer of Mer Kahan, an Arab exterminationist, a man who praised a Jewish settler who killed a Palestinian for throwing a rock at him, a man who was famously acquitted after being criminally charged for chanting death to Arabs, is Israel's current Minister of National Security. He's not some fringe figure either. He's one of the most popular politicians in Israel right now. In the last few days, Israel's been working hard to cast itself as the victim the victim of hatred, the victim of terrorism, the victim of anti-Semitism, that they have no choice but to lay siege to Gaza. But underneath this carefully concocted victim complex is a racist, Jewish supremacist state that's been trying to finish the job that the Nakba started for decades. And really, this shouldn't come as a surprise to anyone. After all, they're literally cutting off water and electricity to a city of two million people right now. Their generals talk openly about flattening Gaza and killing the animals, meaning Palestinians. It's obvious their goal is genocide. This is a picture of me, Hesse Levinson's, uh, taken when I was about six months old and published on the cover of a magazine, uh, of a Nazi magazine, dated January 24, 1935. It says Zone ins Haus, and it represents the, supposed to represent the perfect Aryan baby, uh, but it was me, a Jewish child, on the cover. On the cover of a Nazi magazine. <laughs> 